flangoo.com. There we go. We are now broadcasting live on Facebook for everybody who couldn't make it here, but they are on Facebook. We can say hi to everybody on Facebook. Um, also, and this is great for everybody here to know, um, sometimes at the end of the meeting, uh, people still have questions that they wanted to get to, but we've just run out of time and we couldn't get to everybody's questions. A great place that you can continue to leave questions is on Facebook. So this video is on the teacher's discovery page and you can go there and actually leave your questions as comments right there. And if Jamie, I don't know if you go to our page, if you see those, uh, yeah. but that's a great place where we can continue the Q and a for, you know, long after this event is over, uh, that'll always be there. So if you have questions specifically for her, you can tag her, uh, so that she knows it's that they're there. Or if I see them, of course, I'll, send you a message and let you know, hey, there's new questions up on Facebook. You go check those out. Um, so that's, that's just great. so you know, if we don't get to your questions, it's just a matter of timing. And if you head on over to Facebook, you can post your questions there. So with that, let's get this party started. Hi, everybody. I am Chuck from Teachers Discovery, and it is a wonderful pleasure to have everybody here again this evening for our Jeffrey March, so our third, right? Our third get together. Um, yeah, you guys all know why you're here. So Jamie, I'm gonna let you take it from here and it's your show. Great, thanks Chuck. Um, I'm gonna share my screen in just a few minutes. Um, I just wanted to welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. I can't believe we're actually in our third Wednesday workshop. We've done some great stuff already and tonight um, will not let you down. I'm really excited to share some great documents with you and talk about how to integrate readers for some more extended activities, um, some longer assessments even. And I'm really hopeful that you'll find it um, worthwhile and stuff that you can contribute in your classroom. And like Chuck said, definitely leave feedback because I would love to hear how you're integrating some of this stuff. If you have questions or you can maybe share with me some ways that you integrate at the end. So that would be great. So my name is Jamie Linkow. This is my 20th year teaching Spanish. And I'm just, I've always loved Spanish since I started in seventh grade learning and then listening to the music. And I went on to get my master's and my PhD in Spanish language and literature. And I've really taught every level out there from beginners to the AP classroom. I've, I've pretty much taught it all. And teaching language is a great job. Um, it's high energy, like all of us, I'm sure by the end of the day, we're we're pooped. I mean, we're, we're singing and dancing and running around our classroom. And we do great stuff as language enthusiasts and just really want our students to be excited about learning language and communicating with other people around, around the world. Um, so what I found is that readers really enhance what I'm already doing great in the classroom. We already have our set curriculum. We already have the grammar units that we have to teach and the different assessments and activities. But the readers allow us some more fun in the classroom. They allow different ways for students to really connect personally with cultural themes and, and grammar and vocab that we're, you know, that we're utilizing on the daily. So I've really found in my classrooms that readers just enhance and the kids really enjoy them and I'm enjoying putting them in my classroom as well. So I hope you'll find that useful today as well. So I'm gonna share my screen and just do a quick um, rundown. If you're new to us, with Flangu, I just want to share with you what are some tips and tricks that you can do um, to integrate Flangu into your classroom. So I guess share my screen. There we go. Okay, so I'm just going to pull up here real quick. So this is La Mamba Negra. This is one of our shorter um, readers that is great, especially now March Madness is coming up. We just had um, we just had um, the N the NBA. Oh, geez, what was it called with um, the superstars that, that played in the NBA game? Um, my kids are super into basketball right now. So I thought this would be a great one to show you guys La Mamba Negra, which is a short bio about Kobe Bryant. And this is something you could utilize with your classrooms if you had 
a day between the exam, let's say you gave an exam for a test and a day between wanting to start something new. You could utilize this for a one day lesson, a quick read, or assign it as something extracurricular as well outside of your classroom. But I just wanted to show everybody that what, what the Flangu readers really offer. Right from the beginning, you click on the reader, you can click on here, words to know. It's a quick download that will open. You can hand out to your students. So there's vocab there. You can integrate some of this uh, into the reading. You could play a game. There's, there's things that you could do to get the readers already excited and to know about what are some of the vocab words that are gonna be utilized. There's also, when you open up the readers here, it'll tell you it's a level one. So this is for a, a more basic reader. Um, I would say a Spanish one or two. It's only one chapter, like I said, it's pretty short. And then there are these great um, quiz questions at the end. So here we go, it's just loading. <laughs> Let's give it a second while it's loading here. I'm not sure why that's taken so long. Hang on. Sorry, I'm gonna try a different tab there. Not sure why I'm not loading there. Just give me one second, I'll pull it back up. You can easily go here to search for it. If there's one that I know I'm looking for, I just type it right there in the search bar and up it pops. So I'm right back to where I started. So you know how glitches work in the classroom and it's not gonna to take too much time to find it if you needed to. So here we have back to La Mamba Negra. I just wanna show you what it looks like here. So pre-reading, I'll tell you a little bit about Background and again, this is a reader for a more basic Spanish one class, Spanish two. So they're going to give the students a little bit of background, and then we'll get started with the actual reader. We can go ahead here to chapter one. Okay, and what I really like here is you can see there's words that are underlined. Your students just have to roll over it, scroll over it, and it'll pop up right away what the definition is. We've gone through to decide. What are some words that students really need to know in order to understand the book? So words that might be a little bit out of their reach. If this is a basic student, Spanish one or two, they're not going to know the participle form recordando. So they can easily scroll over it. Vida they might have heard, but again, it would be important for them to know that word. So we've added those great pictures throughout. And like you can see, you can just scroll over it. Your student doesn't have to open up another tab. It's all right there for them. We're always trying to make sure they're focused on the part that you know we want them to be looking at on the screen and it's right here for you. I really like here, just wanna show you one or two other quick tricks here. At the very bottom, you can open up some multiple choice questions. So if you assign this to your students to read on their own, there's always kids that are a little bit more advanced. They're gonna zip through it. Assign them the multiple choice questions that they can, and they could answer in real time. That's something that they could do and know if they're right or wrong immediately. There's also extra um, activities that they could do. I'm just gonna go back to chapter one here. There's extra activities they could do at the very bottom. I'm gonna scroll down here, short answer questions that you could open up as a PDF or a doc. You could print this out for them. They could work together in groups. This is a nice little extension activity, especially if you're planning for the whole period to utilize this reader. There's all these different activities that are included here that you could do. And they're really thoughtful. And the kids like working on that a little bit more to connect personally and just extend what they've read about, about Kobe Bryant. The last thing I wanna show you here is at the bottom, you can have an, a native speaker read aloud the story to your students. So you can press the play button and you could take a break and have the students either listen to the story while you're walking around the classroom, maybe answering any questions, or actually today I utilized this function and I had the narrator read the chapter aloud so we could all read together. And so you see the text, the reader is reading, and I paused it at certain points to ask some follow-up questions or to ask them to do a partner chat with a shoulder partner. So it's great that I'm not pushing my voice out there for another additional time reading this. Sometimes students don't want to read aloud, especially if you have a beginning class, they might be hesitant to read. This is a listening activity that they could do with a native speaker. And the really cool part is this button here on the right, you can speed up and slow down how fast that reader speaks, which is so key because we do have some students that are maybe even heritage speakers or bilingual speakers. They want to hear it at an authentic pace. For your higher level speakers, same thing. But then you have kids that really need to look and think and process, and then you can slow it down. So that's such a great function 
um, I think that we really can utilize well in the classroom. And even at home, if you have those kids at home, like me, I was such a language enthusiast, I would have loved to go home and just read along with the narrator and practice my pronunciation. Instead, I was home singing along to Gloria Stefan's Mi Tierra. I don't know if that's a throwback for anybody, but that was my link into uh, La Musica. Um, and I really loved her. So that was a good one. Okay, Chuck, if you want to load the first doc about um, student student presentation, that would be great. So I'm, I'm going to share with you all um, a reader that I'm actually utilizing right now. And this is going to link to the first doc that Chuck's going to put into the chat about some longer assessment activities. So this is the one that you want to open up. And this is going along with the reader that I'm, that I'm utilizing in my classroom right now. The one I'm suggesting is called Paco y Lucia. So I just wanna open that real quick for you so you can see what that looks like. I'm gonna go back to the main page, the Flangu page. And it's nice here at the top too, all of the books that you've opened recently are right there for you. So if you ever do have a glitch like I just did um, at the very beginning of the presentation, or if this is projecting on your smart board and how many times has your computer ever just literally shut down, it happens to all of us. Same thing for the students. Sometimes it just powers off. Everything's saved for you right here. You click on it and then actually it'll take you back. If you click that continue reading button, it'll take you right back to where you started. Actually, I had a student today say to me, how does it always know what chapter we're on? And I said, well, because you press continue reading and that's where we are, it saves your spot, which is really nice. So this book, Paco y Lucia is a level two, it's 10 chapters. So it's one of our longer ones. It's definitely a thorough novel and it's really great to connect with some themes like contemporary life or public and private identity. Um, all of those themes that uh, are, are pushed out to us from AP and from Actful and all of the different type of um, you know, curricular thematic units that, that we're working on. And in this book, we have two native Spanish speakers that are right in Kansas City and they're having a tough time integrating into life in the suburbs of Kansas City. Um, it's a really nice book that talks about what it means to be um, an outsider, what it means to be judged by the language you speak. And it's some pretty deep cultural themes here um, about conflict, about high school, um, but it really provides students a great look into what it means to be proud of your heritage. It also links to dance and Spanish music at the end because music tends to unite the school and unites everyone at the end. So it's a really nice story. And I'm utilizing this with my juniors right now. So it's a Spanish five class. It's an honors class. And we're in the middle. Actually, this is the chapter we're up to um, today. We read Un Conflicto en la Cafeteria. And there's, there's like a Mean Girls scene. I don't know if any of you have seen that movie, Mean Girls, but my students were definitely connecting with it. So after we've finished the book, this is the plan for the future. When we finish the book, we've talked about some themes. We've talked about language and music and food and culture. There is great extension activities that I'm gonna do. And I'm, I'm sharing this with you now. This is your doc that you could open up. So these are some ideas for some longer assessments or extra activities that you could do after reading. So this would be something that you might've asked them to write um, you know, answers to their printouts for their questions at the end of the chapter. You might've done some chat with a, with a partner. You might've asked them to write a diary entry, something like that. But now you wanna actually have them connect more personally. You want them to take more ownership of their own learning, right? That's something that we're always striving to do, to put the ownership of the learning on the student. The learning should be transparent. So all of these activities are based on the four pillars that we all do in our classroom, on reading, listening, writing, and speaking. And I've divided them up into little activities that I would strategically give to certain students in my classroom. So this is really differentiation at its finest because you are strategically picking a student and assigning them one of these activities. If you have a larger class, you might wanna assign a small pair of like-minded students or same level students. I would suggest doing something where you know a student is struggling in an area and you wanna push them, not too far where they're gonna be 
um, they're going to be frustrated, but you want to push them in an area that you know they need a little bit of help on. Maybe they're not great at writing, so you're going to assign them something that has more of a writing task. Maybe it's a student that struggles to speak out loud in the classroom because they're shy. They need to practice their speaking skills, so I'm going to put them into a speaking section. And I'm very deliberate when I make my assignments, and I'm also very explicit to my classroom, and I will tell the students, hey, I'm assigning you this because this is where I think you need some additional work, some additional reinforcement. And while they're working on these activities, I'm able to go and be with them and, and help them and answer questions and really push them so that they can take ownership for their own, um, for their own studying and for, for their own education. So for the reading activities here, I picked out a couple different things about doing some research, but in a contemporary way. What are the kids gonna connect to that they're really going to feel is is um, meaningful, something that they could utilize in the future. So Paco's family is Dominican. So I said, how would we even get to the Republica Dominicana to Kansas City? If that's where Paco lives, how would he get there? What are flights going to look like? This is a little bit of research that a student would have to actually do some real world research and look for flights on some websites find out about travel time, find out about maybe is there a layover? What is a layover? How much money does it cost? So this is more of a real world um, activity for a student that might be looking to study abroad one day or looking to travel. And then they would do a small write up of that activity. Lucy's family is Mexican. What's going on in Mexico DF? Have you ever been there? What are some populated cities, museums? Can you do a little bit of research and provide some ideas um, about attractions, write three to five sentences. Again, that's all up to you. If this is a more, um, if this is a more um, a beginner class, it might be one to two sentences. It might be simple sentences. If this is a higher level, more advanced class, it might be a paragraph and they have to include a subjunctive expression. It's up to you how robust or how basic you make the different activities. Uh, Latin American foods, they talk about that throughout the, uh, throughout the reader, so that would be something to do for some reading and research. For the listening activities, I ask students to find videos about food, so they talk a lot about Mexican and Dominican food. I give them some ideas, and these kids navigate YouTube better than I navigate my car from home to school. I mean, they know it like the back of their hand. So they find the most amazing videos. And this is for a student who really needs some extra listening practice because they have to listen to those videos a couple times. I tell them to narrow it down to maybe two or three minutes, but then give me five questions and answers that we could pose to your classmates. Simple questions, follow-up questions. Did they like the food? What color was the tablecloth? I mean, it could be so basic, but as students are watching it, they're listening for certain things. And I also ask the student to give me answers because I want to know that that student actually knows what he asked or she asked and they can answer it as well. And sometimes I'll put that student on the spot when we're going over the questions and answers to lead the class. And somebody, you know, feels pretty excited about that most times. For the speaking activity, I'm trying to highlight a student, like I said before, that might be shy in class. That's not really, you know, not really raising the hand to speak or a student that really has, has a good job speaking, but, but just needs some additional help and reinforcement and, and needs to work on pronunciation. So part of this reader is about uniting the school and uniting the high school students through music. So I'm asking them to find some videos about mariachi, flamenco, all different kinds, and um, write a follow-up or provide a follow-up question for their classmates to ask about their opinion of the video. So this would be either live or could be previously recorded. So it might be just a snippet of, you know, somebody doing a dance. It could be dancing with the stars even, and they show, you know, a clip of those of the people dancing. But then that student has to practice some improv about asking a follow-up question to his or her classmates. Something a little bit more robust would be creating a dialogue between Lucy this is the main character and Paco is her friend between the two moms because they get very upset when the children feel bullied and they have this little uh, talk on the balcony. They're preocupada. What might they be talking about to each other? So that would be a nice um, speaking more of improv, more of that informal conversation that we strive to have students create. Uh, and again, they could record their dialogue if they're ambitious. Maybe they want to stand up in front of the class, but that would be a nice speaking activity. And then finally for writing, at the end of the novel, they all are united at this little festival called the Autumn Fest and they sing Gracias a la Vida. 
So my thought would be to have students who are really proficient, their speaking is great, their, their listening is good, have them do something as an extension, but more cultural. Can they take that Mexican song and translate it into English? That would be a practice for grammar. That would be a nice way for people to see how Sometimes the songs that we listen to in English cannot be directly translated into Spanish and vice versa because it really doesn't just make sense. So that would be a nice thing for them to try and work on on their own. And I said here, bonus points if you record yourself singing it. So I know some people in my class will definitely opt for that because I have some definitely outgoing theatrical students that would love to sing. I'm, I know you do too. Uh, one other idea for writing would be a diary entry because Lucy in, in one of the pivotal scenes of the reader, they write on the board, go home Spanish chica. And we talk about in the classroom how she really isn't Spanish. She's Dominicana she, and, and how some people try to, you know, just call everyone who's Spanish speaker Spanish. So we really talk about that and what it feels like to be misunderstood and to feel like an outcast and then maybe a student would be able to write a diary entry about how Lucy feels and focusing here on preterite and imperfect, which is something that repeats in almost all of our intermediate to upper level classrooms. Even if it's not the lesson that you're working on at the moment, it's always something that kids need to practice and review. So that was an additional tool that I wrote there for them to practice the differences uh, as they're telling the story in the past. So if this was a, a, a graded activity, um, I would give students about a day or so after we finished the story. Like I said, this would be, we've read the whole thing together. I'm confident that everybody understands it. And these are some extension activities for them to connect more personally with the text. So I would have the students work on these for about one more class period. And then they would submit everything to me, either through Canvas or Google Classroom or share the doc, whatever it is. And I would present that material to the classroom for the next day or so, or if you wanted to do half a class and half a class, if you wanna drag it out. But that then becomes the material as part of my lesson plan for the next couple periods to integrate all of this information. So students have made a personal connection and now they're contributing to the lesson. I love when that happens because that's one less thing that I had to create on my own. I didn't have to find the videos, they found them. They like them, so I know they're already gonna be invested in the material. So for grading purposes, if this is something that's just going to be a classwork grade that you're going to then share with the students and you're all going to talk about it and do the follow up questions and listen to the student sing his rendition of the Mexican song, then I would probably just give this as a classwork grade was the objective met, you know, did you did you complete the dialogue that I asked you to do, it doesn't have to be perfect. But did it make sense? Remember comprehension and, and getting your message across. That's really what we're striving for our students to complete when we're teaching them a world language. Was your class time used wisely? I mean, that's up to you. That's your prerogative, how you wanna, how you want to grade them. But that's one way that I, I, I sometimes will grade these activities. If you want it to be more of an in-depth in rubric for an assessment, then I would really specify the type of vocabulary, the grammar points. I would grade them for pronunciation. Um, if you're teaching an upper level, we definitely have rubrics about what, you know, what proper pronunciation and intonation and everything looks like. If it was organized, if your slides were clear, those would be my suggestions for a more in-depth assessment if you're actually gonna be grading for um, correct usage and, and that kind of um, perfection of form. So that's the first doc. And the second one, Chuck, if you wanna load up the level one, two midterm assessment, I'm gonna to head to that one next. And as he's loading this, I'm gonna bring up two ideas for books that would um, go along with this. The first one is here, Enrique en el Espacio Exterior, okay? So all of these documents that we're talking about tonight, we're actually gonna be turning into a book. All of the different uh, Wednesday workshops, we're compiling all of this stuff together. So these are little sneak peeks at things that are gonna be going in that book um, with more extensive rubrics and more ideas as well. So I'm excited to, you guys are the first ones to see all of this. So I'm excited and I, I hope you're finding it helpful. So the doc that you should be looking at at the moment is this one here. Um, this is a longer assignment prompt, possibly even for a midterm. And the first suggestion, this is going to be for a level one or maybe even a level two. Um, I'm going to pull up this book here, Enrique en el Espacio Exterior, which is a great 
book about a boy who loves gaming and coding, and he actually jumps into a video game and he has to code himself out of it. So it's a really easy read for students, but it presents a lot of possibilities for them to um, connect personally. It's great for students who are into video games and gaming. It's very easy for them to understand and read, but I think they would really like something like this. And it really works well with the assessment that I'm about to show you. One other idea would be um, El Celular Perdido, which is a cute story about a girl who loses her cell phone, which heaven forbid any of my students ever lose their cell phone. It's attached to their hands 24 seven. Um, so she loses her cell phone and she goes around the city trying to find it with her friends as they skateboard and go to all these different places. So this is another really good one for a beginner level because they're traveling around the city. And that's something that we look at a lot in our vocab list about travel, different areas in the city, different stores. Um, and so this was a really good one too that I thought would be great with this type of longer assessment. So here's the actual assessment that I'm gonna pull up. And this came from an idea last year when my school was in hybrid we were not allowed to give a traditional midterm or final exam. We typically would give multiple choice. We would give a listening section, a speaking section. Our language exams across the board are very in depth. We really test them in all four pillars, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. We were not permitted to do that last year. Every midterm had to be a project. So I tried to think of what were some things that I could do with my students to integrate what we were doing in the classroom but not just, not just a boring you know, talk about grammar or integrated in a paragraph. I wanted something a little bit more exciting and I wanted them to have some ownership over what they were doing. So that's from where this idea came. So you can read here that I, I prompted them with entering a movie making contest that turns your favorite reader into a motion picture movie. So that's why I picked those two readers to show you tonight because they really are pretty creative and there's lots of things that the kids would connect with and think about. So I gave them here a couple questions to think about the plot, the main characters, a scene that they would provide a glimpse into the movie, and then would the public like it. And I integrated here a bunch of different um, requirements for them to do while they were thinking about it. So this project had to be, I would say, between four and five class classes worth of material. We were told at our school that they really wanted to turn it into a thorough uh, project because it was worth 10% of their final grade for the class. So it really had to be in depth. So the end product was a formal paper. It connected with these three themes because those were the themes that we did for the first semester. And the language here, I told them they were going to ask, they were going to be asked to use certain type of vocabulary. Um, all the different uh, curricular vocabulary lists that we had been given was fair game to them. They had to somehow synthesize maybe 10 or 15 words throughout, um, throughout the paper. They had to use some expressions to help them set up the paper properly. These are expressions that I utilize through all of my different classes because it helps the students really organize and be more regimented and specific in their writing, like como punto de partida as they're starting off, además or en cambio as they're furthering or switching gears, a fin de cuentas when they're summing things up. And then when they're giving their opinion to use a mi parecer, rather than just the basic en mi opinión, I'm trying to always strategically give them some more authentic expressions to include. They had to have an introduction, they had to have a paragraph, a conclusion. Again, you can make this as robust or scale it down as much as you want. I allowed the, the students to pick any reader that pertained to those three themes. It had to be something that connected in one of those ways. Like I said, I showed you two that I think are good ones. Some students actually did use those, but I didn't limit them. I wanted to, them to have a personal connection and feel like what they were producing was meaningful to them. For the grammar tenses, these were the three tenses that we had used. Present, imperfect, and preterite was what we were focusing on the most uh, right before that um, assessment was due. We also looked at verbs of emotion. Um, we also looked at indirect objects with, um, with, with verbs like me interesa, nos gusta, things that they could utilize while they were making this movie. And then obviously I always show them about subject verbs, subject adjective agreement, the, the basics. Part of their activity was also a peer edit rubric. So they had to come up with this um, paper, but they also had to have a peer edit their 
paper and they had to edit a, a peers. So I provided them with this rubric and this was also part of their grade. So I gave them prompts here to check subject verb agreement. They needed to find an example of an error. We all know that when students are looking over somebody else's work, it in turn ends up helping them on their own work as well. So this was really you know, a great way for them to think about their own paper and do some self-analysis while they were reading a friend's paper as well. And I was very um, deliberate about who I paired up together. I didn't just let them read a friend's. I was very specific that I wanted, um, for this one, I kept um, the, the same level student grading the other same level. I did not vary it up with a high and a low. I kept it into, you know, more homogenous groups so that they, were, they knew what they were looking for and could provide appropriate feedback. So you can see here the different things that I asked them to find. They had to find examples of all this stuff in the, um, in the friend's paper. And if they didn't find it, then the friend was lacking. So that was really telling. Same thing for language. Is there anything they can't understand? What about the scene? Um, and then two suggestions for the student overall. That was something that was really interesting. I collected all the rubrics. They had to turn that in once they turned in their paper. So this really was, if, if this was a midterm, this was a very extensive one. Um, that was permissible by our guidelines last year. Okay, so that was for a more, I would say, it could be for, um, you know, a beginner class, I would say a Spanish two or maybe even a Spanish three intermediate, but I also want to show you what you could do for a more advanced class as well. So Chuck, if you could load that uh, level two or three longer assessment, this is the one we're looking at here. And this would be for the same type of idea. Again, if I, I last year I was not able to give um, a typical midterm to my, my higher level students either. So I wanted to come up with something that was really in depth for them to really try and get them to think about the listening and the speaking um, and connect with a reader. So I'm just gonna share with you a reader that I thought was great here. This is uh, Los Crypto Judios. This is a level three. This is actually my reader. I wrote this one um, and I, I happen to like it. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, so this is about a little boy named David who is on a class assignment to find out about his ancestry. And he doesn't know who his ancestors are. And he finds out that they were actually Jews all the way back during um, the Renaissance time, uh, 1492 and after when the Inquisition was happening. And his, his relatives were what we would call crypto judios. They were secret Jews. So they practiced Judaism in secret because they knew that they would be expelled if anyone found out that they were Jewish. So it's a really great reader about what it means to have ancestry, what it means to have secrets in your history, and what it means to um, connect personally with your own identity. So that's a great reader. It's a level three, so it's going to have subjunctive, future, conditional. All our level three readers are really for your advanced students. So I think that would be a great one to pair here with a longer assessment. So I had my students pick something that connects to identidad, so public and private identity. And that's why I showed you that reader, because I would suggest that to you or even to my class if I, if I do this um, type of midterm again. So here's the objectives. Not only do they have to read the text, they also have to answer chapter questions, and they're going to create a slideshow that connects the main character's actions. So four slides are what they're going to create. And each slide answers the question given about the protagonist, about the identity, about a problem that the protagonist is confronted with. And then slide four is about the future of that character. So I wanted to integrate, again, that personal connection that our students are making with the reader. But what will the future be like? Um, I wanted them to integrate the future tense because that was our last grammar unit of the year. So that was purposeful um, for them to see that use of será, and K predices, what do you predict? So here's their requirements. They had to answer any three sets of chapter questions. It was up to them what they wanted to answer. Um, they just had to turn it in or share the doc with me. They had to create the slideshow. And there's the, you can see number three was the text on the slideshow of what they had to have. I reminded them of the different grammar points that we've learned this year, future, conditional, progressive. Those were just a couple. Um, they had to use two expressions. You've already seen some of the expressions on other docs as well that I've shared with you. They also had to include the subjunctive because this was an upper level class. We had, we had studied subjunctive, which I'm sure for most of you, if anybody taught subjunctive last year in a hybrid scenario, it wasn't easy, but we did it. And I wanted them to show me that they were able to include it in their 
in their slides as well. Each slide had to have a picture. So it really was a nice presentation for these students to come up with. Um, the final thing was a recording. So this was that final piece because this was an upper level class, I wanted them to practice pronunciation. And I knew, especially with some of my high flyers that they would be re repeating and repeating and repeating until they got that accent just perfect. And that's exactly what I wanted, especially last year when we were in just either a hybrid or a virtual scenario, we weren't getting the students to speak as much. Even this year, um, it's hard with all the masking and, and the students just aren't, you know, aren't producing as much as they would in a typical year. We're just slowly now seeing them come back to normalcy. So the practice of reading and pronunciation was a really great um, thought at the end because I was able to really hone in on some of their skills while they did that. So here's their grade. You can see everything here was utilized. You could assign as many points as you want for each thing. And again, depending on what the class you're teaching, you could swap out subjunctive for the progressive tenses. You could swap it out for commands. Maybe they're commanding um, the protagonist to do certain things, um, or they're maybe asking certain questions. You can get in who, what, where, when, and why. You can tweak all of this based on what is it that you're doing in your classroom and what purpose do you want the students to fulfill as they're connecting um, with the slides. Okay, so that was, again, just another example of a longer assessment that you could have these students do inside or outside of the classroom. This could certainly be a take home activity to be handed in on their own. It could be a group work as well. That's that's totally at your discretion how you think it's going to work best. Okay, the final one I want to show you um, is the um, uh, an informal conversation practice. So, Chuck, if you want to load that one into the chat, that would be great. And this is my, it's called my guillon, this is my script. And this directly aligns to the informal conversation prompt of the AP exam. So this is something that even if you're teaching Spanish one, Spanish two, I mean, I teach a Spanish two class this year and we do a lot of just improv where we try and work on question and answer. Uh, in my Spanish three class this, this year, we have something called situation cards that are produced by the textbook and they have prompts. So you have student A and student B. And student A asks, well, how is your day? And student B is supposed to respond affirmatively or respond negatively. And the students are always trying to come up with some type of dialogue, some type of um, improv conversation. The end result of all of that is when you get to the AP level and you actually have an informal conversation that you are recording and that's part of your AP exam. So this could align to really any class from one to AP um, that practices that type of informal conversation. So my suggestion here, and I'm actually doing this right now with, um, with one of my classes and it's, it's going great. It's a two part assignment. The first is that they have to read one of the books, read any reader, and it's up to you to decide if it's an intermediate class, maybe they're reading a level two. If it's a more advanced class, they have to read something in the level three. They then have to pick one of these themes. Um, and again, feel free to change it up as you see fit but talking about opinions, talking about themes. It has to be very general so that this informal conversation can flow. Otherwise, if the friend hasn't read the same book, it's not gonna flow. So it has to be very generalized talking about a reader that they have just read. So the student has to include five exchanges. So that would be five prompts that they are trying to elicit questions and answers from their partner. They're gonna record those prompts and allow 20 seconds of space for the, for the partner to respond. So for example, if I've just read Los Crypto Judios, I'm gonna start my exchange by saying, Hola amigo, acabo de leer un libro y me gustó. Te gusta leer? And then I'm gonna allow 20 seconds of dead air so that the person that I've asked that question to could respond properly. And then I'm gonna continue the conversation just like they do on the situation cards, just like they do on the AP exam. And I'm going to continue it five separate times. So there's gonna be five times that I'm speaking and then 20 seconds of dead air space for the person to respond. So that's the first prompt. That's, I'm sorry, that's the first task for students to come up with this guillon. What is the script? Then they're gonna submit that to you. You are going to then post it either on Canvas, on Google Classroom in your stream. I posted it on Canvas in my discussion stream so that all of my students can see or hear the, the wavelength of, um, of, the, of the friend's guion of their informal conversation. And then they will listen 
and they fill in that 20 second gap. So when they hear te gusta leer and have the 20 second gap, they're responding. Si, sí, me gusta leer, acabo de leer um, el celular perdido. Es muy interesante, una chica pierde su teléfono y, and then all of a sudden the other person pops back in with their recording. So at the end, they're recording a whole thing and submitting that to you. And it's a complete conversation between two students that were never even in the same room together talking at the same time. It's a great way for kids to practice this type of informal conversation, even for your high flyers and your AP kids. This is something they're gonna have to do on the exam, but it's great for them to look at this informal conversation from a different viewpoint because now they're creating it. Uh, it worked swimmingly uh, with my class when we were actually sent home in 2020. This, that's where this really came from because we were all home, no one was allowed to talk, and I had kids about to take an exam, about to take an AP exam in a matter of weeks, and I needed them to practice this section of the exam. So in their homes, they each recorded their portion, they sent it to me at the very end, and it was, it, it honestly brought tears to my eyes to hear my students speaking to each other because I hadn't heard from them in weeks because we were all home in quarantine. Um, and I decided to continue it last year, even though we were back in person and it worked just as well. And I'm actually doing it again right now. So like I said, it's a great way for kids to listen to each other as a listening practice, but also take a look at the informal conversation from the opposite lens as the creator, rather than simply the person who's responding. If you were gonna grade this, um, I give them credit for filling in the requirements for recording their voice. So I would say about 20 points I might give them for just that beginning part. And then when they actually complete the conversation and, and, and are the partner to the first part, then I would give them an actual, um, an, an actual grade on pronunciation, on using certain expressions. I would be a little bit more deliberate in my grading um, to listen to make sure that they did answer all the questions properly. So that is everything for tonight. So that's, you have at your, your access four different documents there that I really hope you'll find useful and that you could tweak on your own and really make it your own as, as you see fit in your different classrooms. So I guess we can open it to some questions and comments and I'd love, I love your feedback. Yeah, if anybody's got any questions, you can post them either in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask a question that way. Yes, I thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I'm gonna. I I did enter a question when I register. I believe. Um, mm -hmm. a, I like to know because the only the only material that I bought is the one about the girl that is a marathon runner and that she runs with without sneakers Reina. or anything. What's her name again? I forgot. I think it's Lorena La. Oh, Lorena. Lorena. La, sí, Lorena. Um, but how how does this fit with uh, a curriculum requirement of authentic uh, literature or authentic materials? So I would look at that as more of a biography because it's talking about if if I'm correct, um, she's a runner. I think maybe from Peru. No, uh, Nicaragua, no. Guatemala. Okay. okay, so it would connect in a sense of biography. That would definitely be identidad pública y privada. That would be vida contemporánea. You could connect that in a host of ways um, because that's a study of culture and then connect it to you know their own life. That could be um, community, family and community, that theme as well. Okay, all right. So then would you haven't received any like a... a criticism or anything like that because of the material is not actually written by uh, a, a heritage a heritage speakers or heritage speakers. Okay, so it, because it's not written by a Spanish speaker, is that your question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think that matters because it's written for the purpose of a language learner. So it's mm -hmm. written with the intent for students learning Spanish. Um, okay. It's not, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't classify that as an AP Spanish literature novel. It's not, no. it's more of a biography, but it's written, all of our readers, whether it's Spanish, French, German, they're all written 
with the intent of helping okay. students learn language. So that's very yeah. purposeful how we write our readers, the words that we choose, the repetition of the verbs that we have. Um, everything is written with a certain intent. So it's even better than if you just found a book written by a Spanish speaker, because these are written with the intent of helping kids learn how to read in a world language. Okay, great, perfect. Thank you. Sure. I have a comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. No, I have a comment okay. about the readers. Uh, the same thing, uh, some of the history requests to have authentic material. So I think that the question of the previous teacher is about that. Are these readers that Spanish speaking uh, will read? Because it's now, it's hard to use in class because we, we just have justified that they are authentic readers. Yes, and I, I would am. just I would say that they are because they're full of expressions. Uh, we pride ourselves on including certain colloquialisms, um, different words depending on where it takes place. So yes, they are authentic readers. Are they written by by native Spanish speakers? That I don't know that you know how we would know that. Um, but they are they are authentic you know Spanish readers. I do know that uh, I do know that some of them are some of them are actually written by native speakers. Um, and if you're looking for those specific books, for some reason, you can uh, send us an email at flangu at teachersdiscovery.com uh, and just let us know what you're looking for. And, and we could tell you which books uh, might fit that criteria. Well, to be authentic, it doesn't matter who write the book is who mm -hmm. read the books are native speakers oh. reading these books. Absolutely, could be. Mm. It could be a native it. speaker reading the book, and a native speaker would have the oh. same um, connection. So the, everything that we're you, using. You mean, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chuck. I was gonna say, you, you mean like the uh, like the audio for the for the books? No, I mean the readers, the books. Is that the books that uh, a person in Spain will read? If the answer is yes, this is authentic. If the answer is no, this is not authentic. I just trying so, to answer right, no, that. So it is all the 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 these, these are not books in translation. So maybe that's a way for you to kind of pivot around. These are written like the book that I wrote, El, Los Crypto Judíos, was written in Spanish. This was not a translation. None of our books, from what I understand, are translations. Um, we do have um, graphic novels that are based on, you know, some of that, it has some translations in it, but everything is written in Spanish. So that is the first language. And like I said, it's very purposeful that we're incorporating things. So it is authentic. Are they reading this in Spain? They sure could if they buy a Flying Goose subscription, um, but you're not finding these books anywhere in English. I, I, I think that was the question you're looking for. I think also when they're talking about being authentic, it's like, is it an authentic folktale? Is it, that's what I think, uh, they're trying to say, and these are created are not authentic, you know what I mean? So that's where, like I teach elementary school, so it doesn't matter to me which kind it is, but for high school, the requirements are more strict. So if this is, a, if this is based on an authentic uh, folktale, or for example, uh, the, um, what is this called? El Trunche, that's an authentic folktale from Peru. So we actually, uh, that we have something called El Chupacabras. That's one of the yes, folktales that, that I'm thinking of. And, yes. and we have that. We have that on all of our different levels. Yes. So yes, we do have plenty of folktales. We have different texts about biographies mm -hmm. of oh, speakers around Sorry. the world. So you really will find a little bit of everything. Like the one that I showed you today about Kobe Bryant, no, that he's obviously not a native speaker, but you could find, uh, we have um, El Gigante, uh, which is a baseball player. We just added that one to our list and he is um, a Spanish speaker. I can't remember I, I, what country he's from. Uh, Frida Kahlo, hey, Jamie, Jamie. Uh, Frida Kahlo, yes. Yeah, Jamie, I'm sorry. I think I opened a Pandora box. I actually think that conversation probably is for, um, to bring, to be, supposed to be brought to ACTFEL or any other association because I, I personally have been teaching for a long time. I'm a native speaker and I and I don't know who came up with this. Um, I understand that um, authentic li uh, literature for the, 
for the language classroom has to be written by a native speaker for native listeners. That's right. the definition. If, and I if that's have to what adapt. you're looking for. Uh, yes. Uh, I always if that's have what to you're adapt. looking for. I have. Yep. Hold on just a second. I actually have what you're looking for. Um, we have a document that actually shows our actual alignment for Flangu. So Perfect. if that's what you need, I can absolutely share that with you. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. But also, I but also what we can do as teachers is look above and beyond. Okay. Yes. It's great that teachers discovery and um, Flangu is giving us a start native speakers to native speakers folk tale. Then we can also look beyond in source folk tale that we can look for. Like for example, I know there are folk tales that are bilingual that we could look from different countries. I'm also a native speaker certified from Mexico. And I look from different countries because also it gives them a different flavor for learning Spanish. So even coming here for the Hispanic, um, for the Chicanos, we can say, we can put something like folktale and it's my folktale from here. Like right now we're watching Encanto and it's Puerto Rican and some of the base and it's, um, it's Colombian. And with us from Mexico, we're teaching it. And it has pretty much the base of what, um, um, Walt Disney, the uh, Little Mermaid, if you hear the bass of it, it's from uh, uh, the Little Mermaid, and Little Mermaid is German, from De from Denmark and Germany. So it's, it's, when we look at full tales, sometimes we have the, uh, the influence not only from one country, we got full tales that are influenced from both Latin America, Europe, so, and also it's teaching diversity. Not only okay, uh, Latin America were only influenced by the Native Americans, like the um, the people from the Andes, the uh, Quechua, or the Aztecs or the Mayans, but also by the Spanish. So, and also, that's that's a conversation that could definitely mm -hmm. go on for a very long time too. Um, I know. I I would say um, I, I would love to keep this one going too. Um, I know let's post that over on on facebook and and see yes. what other kind of answers that we get for this because uh i'm, I'm really curious to know um Chuck, I, there's a I did couple share the in, i'm sorry there's a couple questions in the chat i don't know if you saw yeah. i just wanted to make sure um, i got to those yeah let's um, go ahead and get to those please yeah victoria asked about um how do two students contribute to the same recording file which is a great question and it took me a while to figure this out so once the student submits his recording uh, if you're using Canvas, they're able to record right on Canvas. Um, otherwise, you can just have them, my students sometimes record on their phone or video recorder on their Chromebook, and they will email me that. Then I can, I can put that either in my stream. Uh, like I said, in Canvas, I could do it as a discussion post so it's accessible to them. Or I would do it in my Google Classroom post for the day and just post the, the wavelength for them to listen to. Then they would have to record themselves as they're listening to the recording. So it's really only, it's, it's only ever one recording for the full conversation. So for example, they press play on, on the Canvas discussion or on Google Classroom and the conversation starts. At that 20 minute pause, they begin speaking. Then they hear again the next prompt then they fill in the final, the next 20 seconds and it goes on and on and on. And then they press stop on their recorder. Usually it's their phone and that's the full conversation. So you're actually, the second student is re-recording the first student with their voice now in place. So it's one seamless recording. I hope that answered your question. Okay, so if I don't have Canvas, use phones. Yeah, I would use phones. Um, you could use Flipgrid. I see some other people put in here about using Flipgrid. I found it was a little bit, even, even Canvas, I find to be a little bit cumbersome at times. And with the recording, it was. And a way around it, I actually had the IT department help me with this. I wasn't able to, sometimes when they email me stuff from their phones, I'm not able to then take that and place it somewhere else. So if that were to happen to you, like sometimes they'll email me a recording if it's not on Flipgrid and I can listen to it and it's not a problem. 
but I can't always take that I can't always take that recording and place it in Google Classroom or in Canvas. So a way around it, if you needed to, would just be to use Screencastify and play their recording and screencast it. And you could also have your students do that too. So if they're working on a Chromebook, let's say, they could open up the first part and listen and then be doing a screencast as they record themselves as well. That's another workaround if you don't have Canvas or if they don't have voice recorder, that's a great app for a Chromebook if, if that's what your school uses. All right. Do we have any other questions? All right, I posted in the chat that uh, all of the PD certificates will be emailed probably by this Friday. Um, I will also include a link to the video that's on YouTube for those of you who aren't on Facebook. If you are on Facebook, the video is actually there right now because we've been streaming it live. So you can actually go to facebook.com. You can look us up at Teachers Discovery, uh, or I will actually post a link straight to us. Uh, the video is probably one of the first things on there right now. So if you want to use the comments section and post more questions or continue the conversation, we would absolutely love that. So please do. Yeah, that would be great. I see a couple of you saying you had some follow up or more. I'll definitely check that and I'm happy to get in contact with you. That'd be great to collaborate. I'm really excited to hear how you'll use uh, these documents. Yeah, um, absolutely. Ms. Linko, I'm sorry. I just had a question about the book that you were talking about earlier. Sure. You were talking about that you were putting those resources that you just pulled up earlier, you were putting them in a, a book, but I didn't yeah. Is that something that's going to be available for everyone who has the subscriptions? We're working on that. So all of the Wednesday um, workshops that we're that I'm that I'm hosting, we're going to be turning that and all of the materials into a book. So it's in the works. I'm not quite sure how that's going to um, pan out just yet, but I'm working okay. on it. Okay. Okay. I did download those. Um, what you put up. Um, so I do have those. But I was just wondering if you add more. If you're going to just yeah, just wanted to know how to access them. But thank you. Sure. Um, there are multiple events, like one every month. Um, if you head over to our Eventbrite, you can register for multiple or for all of them, as many of them as you want. Uh, and I would recommend, even if you can't make it, do be sure to register because that's how you're going to get the links uh, and the emails. So you'll get, you know, email a link to the videos, you'll get an email link to all the downloads, all that stuff. So please be sure to register for those. And next uh, Wednesday, April 4th, is speaking and listening skills. I just wanted to push that out there for everybody. Perfect. Awesome. So the last uh, part, and, and we will receive, you say, maybe in a week or by Friday, we will receive. Probably like, by, yeah, yeah, that's going to come out probably by Friday. All right. Oh, all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last last question. Um, I, At one point, you guys were thinking about doing the Italian also. Is that coming to fruition at any point? Um, I know that Italian came out for Voces, so it's on our radar of things that we need to do. Let's see, Italian is on the list of things <laughs> we want to do. Uh, I think English was on there, like uh, an ESL program oh, was also great. in there. So yeah, there was all like, yes, we want Flangu to expand. We want it to get a lot bigger, but I know right now we're still trying to get uh, the languages that are there to get bigger. Uh, I, I think German's been kind of lacking behind. French could certainly stand to get a bit bigger too. There are more titles coming. Um, German's getting a whole bunch, I think, pretty soon. So is French. So Great. there are more books coming. I couldn't tell you how soon we'd be getting to other languages, but it's definitely something we want to do. Okay, so then I'm going to say goodbye. I'm in the classroom. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Like, so much. Like, I will, I will I think come. That's a great idea. Um, I will see you guys in April, and then I'm going to go and watch the ones that I missed before. Um, yeah, YouTube. do that. Yeah. They're, they're up on YouTube and they're on our Facebook page. So you can go to either one and find those. Okay. Thank you so much. Good night. Drive safe. Bye. <laughs> All right. Bye. <laughs> Jamie, thanks so much for doing this with us again. This was fun. A lot of fun. I'll see you guys hopefully um, for the April one. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Watch for my email. Everybody okay, take bye. care. Thank you. Bye now.